The buildup for war with Iran is drawing comparisons to the buildup to the war with Iraq. The hysteria, the faked or outdated intelligence, even some of the same personalities who tried to refute that intelligence are back on the scene. Now war is already being posed in the British press as ready in time for Christmas, but we know it could just be a matter of days. An attack of this nature immediately brings in the interest of Russia and China. And it, it would also allow Barack Obama to bring into the conflict the entire United States nuclear arsenal. What we are seeing is not a repeat of Iraq. It is a push into high gear of the centuries-old British policy of perpetual war with the aim of reduction of populations across the planet. Today, we are under conditions of global economic collapse, which threatens to push the empire out of existence as the powers of the Pacific gain further prominence. The natural state of affairs in the world is perpetual war in the eyes of the British Empire. In response to the collapse, that same perpetual war policy used by the British to balance the world according to their designs will go from steady control of regional conflict and genocide to annihilation of entire cities in one swipe using the most powerful of weaponry on our planet. We are now at a point of singularity for the world. No one has ever seen an economic collapse of this magnitude, and no one has ever seen what the British Empire will do in order to keep control in the face of it. The British Empire has operated on the basis of the oligarchical principle since its inception. The Empire's model, Rome, provided for it a blueprint for how an empire can successfully rule for a thousand years, and Britain would be determined to advance beyond it. In the 18th century, after the Seven Years' War, the British East India Company faction came into predominant power on the British Isles. It would no longer be run by a traditional monarchy, but by a financier, global corporation, which it was determined would even have the power to launch war free from the control of the king and his government. Under this model, all nations of the world were subordinate to the free-flowing capital of the empire. The British East India Company would be the system under which nations would be pitted against one another, populations eliminated, and slavery expanded in order to facilitate its growth. In 1770, it was revealed to the people of the colonies in British North America that over 10 million people in India had died in a single year. The mass death was the result of a famine induced by the British East India Company which five years previously had been granted total governing control of the British territories in India. With word of this, and of the power shift that had occurred in Britain, the Americans launched their break through the American Revolution. The American Republic represented a threat to the empire that would never be forgiven. Furthermore, any potential for another republic like the United States would not be tolerated. France's attempt was crushed by the manipulation of its revolution and subsequent outbreak of the Napoleonic Wars. Although Britain engaged in that war, she was conveniently at arm's length across the English Channel, impenetrable to invasion due to its enormous maritime strength as the powers on the continent butchered one another, resulting in nearly four million deaths. Such a tactic of meddling from a safe distance would be conveniently deployed by the Empire to this day. In the 19th century, the Empire launched third-party wars of destabilization, which resulted in what we saw in the 1890s Balkans War. The most crucial effort for the British was the breakup of the United States. When that effort failed, Britain focused her sights on the destruction of Europe and the elimination of all rival empires. The process that ensued of perpetual war led into World War I. With the United States under the control of Lincoln, a rogue confederacy deployed out of British Lord Palmerston's zoo launched a vicious attack on the U.S. Republic. This proved an opportunity to bring the American colonies back into the fold of the empire. However, Britain conveniently positioned itself to allow supplies and funding to fuel the Confederacy, while again staying at an arm's length, allowing the Habsburgs, Napoleon III and others, 
to take the brunt of the Confederacy's loss. Britain, losing its chance in defeat, was still able to come out on top in Europe and manipulate the powers to set up another genocidal war. As those seeds of destruction were being sown, the U.S. made a fundamental breakthrough in the form of development of the vast interior of the United States continent. An advanced, internally developed nation meant the opposite of the British policy of genocide. It meant growth in the population, advancement of its technology, and a shift in the identity of mankind from slave to a citizen with the power of creativity. In the decades following Lincoln's assassination, the world took a turn away from the progress made under the influence of the American system. As the empire looked on, her former colony had surpassed every nation in the world in manufacturing and internal development, including itself. Statesmen who had been inspired by the American experiment were removed from the international stage. In 1881, Alexander II, the initiator of the great network of railways in Russia, which were inspired by the American Transcontinental Railroad, was assassinated. Six months later, in the United States, Republican President James Garfield was also assassinated. And in Europe, pro-American system Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, the one leader who understood the British strategy the most, was ousted from his position in 1890. At this point, no obstacle existed between the British and the balkanization of the continent, which culminated in World War I. Under these conditions of political upheaval, the British Empire expanded her sphere of influence. While tirelessly promoting free trade and monetarism in one sphere, she shamelessly sponsored the rise of Marxism, anarchism, and terrorism in another. What all this activity was intended to yield was a world war that would generate the deaths of over 35 million people. The only thing that brought this to a standstill was the presidency of FDR, and the leadership provided against the next wave of British-sponsored genocide called World War II, which resulted in the deaths of over 60 million people. If Franklin D. Roosevelt had not been in the presidency, it is probable that the British intention for a globe limited to one billion people would be where we're at today. It wasn't until he died that the British resumed that process. Conventional history says that the British Empire ended after the war. But the doctrine of environmentalism sustains the use of genocide for population reduction. And the Cold War structure that they created continued the strategy of perpetual war. In essence, there is no change in the British intention since the 1700s, despite their name change to the Commonwealth. Churchill was used to promote global division during the Truman administration in creating enemies where there were once friends, sparking smaller regional wars effectively across the entire globe, all in the name of the Cold War. The creation of the Ark of Crisis in the Middle East armed those who today we call terrorists in order to fight the Soviet Union. After the Cold War, the Ark of Crisis was catapulted center stage into what is today our new Balkans. The British policy of perpetual warfare and constant instability has been run through several presidents of the United States and it currently has control over the presidency of Barack Obama. Why would anyone think that a war with Iran would be won in isolation when the intent is driven with the stated goal of reducing the world's population? They have made this clear themselves over centuries. The collapse of the transatlantic system means the empire must react quickly, driving their idea of the natural state of perpetual war and depopulation into a global holocaust. 35 million people were killed in World War I. Over 60 million deaths occurred in World War II. Today, with the use of nuclear warheads, it will be billions. This isn't a distant threat. It is happening here. This time, the Hitler is in the White House, and it is his sick mind around which the centuries-old strategy is being played. You don't have to wait for the first missile to be launched in order to know that. It is an open book. 
no one will be able to say they could not know.